in podcasts. Um, I'm delighted that this after, this um, evening we have a really wonderful uh, book to introduce to you. This is happening at a time when China is doing fantastically well. Uh, China is going from strength to strength. Xi Jinping is consolidating his position and is consolidating his power. The rest of the world are now paying attention to how wonderfully China is doing. It's a time when there is really no reasons to think that China may be getting into trouble at all. Now that is of course if you simply look at it from one particular dimension. And as you know China is a complex matter and therefore there are many different angles to it. And we have to this evening, somebody who has written a really fantastic book, which is called Red Flags, Why Xi Jinping's China is in Jeopardy. And the author is, of course, George Magnus. And he is a research associate at SOAS and also at the Oxford China Center. He has a long and very distinguished career, and I'm not going to repeat the long uh, introduction that you will have read on our website. I will just highlight that he was the chief economist of UBS. He had made quite a bit of predictions that turned out to be true. And he's also author of three books, including, I will only highlight two of them, Uprising Will Emerging, emerging Markets Shape or uh, Shake the World Economy? Um, with with uh, George is Jonathan Fanby CBE. Jonathan is the chairman of the China Research and Managing Director of the European Political Research at TS Lombard. He's written nine books on China. Again, I'm not going to read you all the very many excellent books he has written. And he is also a research associate at the Soas China Institute and he has, at the end of the summer, published a new book, which is called Crucible, 13 Months That Forged Our World. Um, it has China in it. It's not entirely about China. It's an excellent read. I think you should be um, checking it out. Um, Jonathan had a distinguished career as a journalist, and as a journalist, he edited The Observer, as well as the South China Morning Post when it was still the premier newspaper in East Asia as a whole. Uh, well, yeah. What it is now, I think it's up to you to draw the conclusion. <laughs> and I'm also delighted to int introduce to you uh, Carrie Gracie, who in fact needs no introduction. Is there anyone in this room who doesn't know who Carrie Gracie is? Yes, you don't. Excellent. You then you will have my um, verbal introduction for Carrie because I was nearly tempted to simply dispense with that. But nobody should be left behind. <laughs> now Carrie is a remarkable um, and very distinguished journalist, but before that she also was an incredibly uh, entrepreneurial person because she actually set up a restaurant before she went to Oxford to do her PPE. And after that, she would have also created um, an enterprise. She joined the BBC in 1987. She reported in China in the 1990s. And then in 2014, she became the China editor for the BBC. And in fact, she is up to today, the only ever China editor of the BBC. So I I think it's about time that the BBC get a new China editor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's for the simple reason that when she was actually reporting from China as the China editor, you could actually see the quality of the BBC's China reporting being actually really, really top notch. Um, Kerry has also made documentaries uh, about China for the BBC, uh, TV and radio, for which she had won prizes like a peer body and a, um, an Emmy. I think something else that 
I perhaps should, should mention, even though that is not really that much related to China, is that s since January 2018, Kerry has been playing the lead role in fighting for equal pay for uh, women journalists in the BBC, which I think is something that uh, we would all like to recognize. The format for this evening is that I will uh, uh, request George to make a short introduction to his book, about 15 minutes, and then I will ask Jonathan and Carrie to provide their perspectives of having read the book. Over to you, George. Uh, thanks very much, Stephen. Very, uh, very good evening to you all. Um, so this book um, that you've seen outside on the table, um, Red Flags, is really, it, it's about the features and the sustainability of China's model uh, seen through the prism of uh, four contemporary economic challenges domestically and two uh, external challenges. So the, the four domestic challenges uh, relate to management of China's debt, uh, trying to keep its currency stable and uh, widely used in the world, um, aging, um, and the so-called middle income trap, which, which the country is having to negotiate and address and uh, make policies towards simultaneously in the face of growing issues of contention in, in each area. So it's quite a, quite a big task. Uh, and the two external challenges, as you can imagine, are trying to manage um, not only China's trade and investment vis-a-vis -vis the West, uh, but also its relations with Belt and Road countries around the world in the face of a growing level of pushback, uh, whether it's from Western capitals or from some of the recipients of Chinese financing in the Belt and Road. <clears throat> and specifically, um, all of these things are taking place in the context of, and this is the kind of key thing in the book really, of a change of governance under President Xi Jinping, which I conclude in the book is going to make it harder for China to meet its ambitious goals. If we were talking about somebody else's China, the conclusion might be very different and I might not have read, written the book. Uh, but in Xi Jinping's China, I think it matters. And it matters for a number of different reasons, uh, many of which are uh, perhaps intuitively or knowledgeably very obvious to you. The first is that in the last decades, China has changed remarkably from being a kind of a compliant customer of the West uh, to becoming a very feisty competitor, first of all in low value goods and then in high technology or medium technology products nowadays, uh, to becoming an adversary and rival <clears throat> uh, in matters of trade and technology and uh, now tetchy international relations. The second transformation uh, that China has been through, or is going through, was from uh, an economy uh, that thrived, actually, after 1979, 1980, on liberalizing reform, um, but has become one that has become dependent on credit creation, uh, leading to chronic misallocation of lending and resources, and considerable imbalances in the economy and inequalities. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, Wen Jiabao himself uh, referred to the imbalances in China uh, with great uh, significance in both 2007 and then 2011 before he stood down from office. And even last year at the 19th Party Congress, um, Xi Jinping embraced the change in the party's central contradiction, um, which relates to uh, imbalances in the economy and um, being inadequate uh, for the, uh, to meet the better quality of life that people expect and so on and so forth. And the third and really important change uh, transformation is in its political system, uh, from one that was known for its pragmatism and for managing change really well, uh, to one that emphasizes more authoritarianism, it's become more controlling, more ideological, more oppressive, and much less reformist uh, than any of its predecessors in many ways. So I mentioned just at the beginning that the book was about the China model, and you might think that that phrase is pretty innocuous, 
It's used all the time in all sorts of different contexts. But it actually has become very sensitive. It's become very sensitive in Western capitals. It's also become quite sensitive inside China. Just this month, according to Professor Zhang Weiying at Peking University, and also Professor Sheng Hong at the Unirul Institute, which is still just about managing to cling on to, uh, to life after they, lots of fears that it might be shut down. Uh, but according to these esteemed professors, um, there are those in China, he, they say, who have championed China's kind of exceptional exceptionalism in the Chinese model, um, specifying the part, role of the party, the state sector, and industrial policy. And they say that, um, that this view is not only wrong, but is actually resulting in the pursuit of policies which threaten China's future and are leading to confrontation with the West. And uh, Professor Zhang, in particular, says that uh, these policies are incompatible with fair trade and world peace, his words, not mine, um, and that the real success in China over the last decades actually has not been anything exceptional about uh, made in China, but actually about a universal model based on China's adaptation of marketization, entrepreneurship, and the accumulation of technology brought in from other countries from all around the world. So this is quite a controversial view about where this model is actually leading and, um, uh, and what its uh, particular features and characteristics are uh, today. Now, I uh, draw my conclusion in the book, which is to say that we can't be so assertive or bold to actually say that China's model is doomed to fail. We simply don't know. Um, certainly, China is not like, uh, in many ways, not like uh, the Soviet Union was at its peak. But we don't have any empirical evidence uh, to demonstrate that authoritarian countries uh, that specify the kind of features that I've described have actually become rich in terms of OECD type of income per head levels and certainly haven't been able to address satisfactorily the range of problems um, that China has uh, before it, as I outlined before. In fact, if you look at China under Xi Jinping and you see, for example, strengthening of state-owned enterprises, uh, the expansion of party influence and state power, the increasing reliance on state-led industrial policy, uh, disengagement from the U.S. in particular and from other Western countries, and the stalled reform efforts which actually have left many private firms really rather uh, on the cusp, as it were, in terms of their role in the economy. It's quite easy to see why the future might look much more uncertain uh, than uh, what we have grown to expect in decades gone by, and why China might actually face both a protracted period of much lower economic growth um, and unpredictable policy and political environment, um, which we can get into uh, during our discussion later. So uh, in just a few minutes, I'm going to uh, only summarize some of the uh, key areas which um, I've kind of um, spoken about in the book. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about debt, a little bit about aging, a little bit about middle income trap, and about trade. So we have lots of other things we can get into in our discussion. Um, debt is the most pressing of China's problems. Um, uh, it's currently estimated that it reached a level of about 330% of GDP at the end of last year. Uh, nobody really knows if there's a magic level. There isn't actually a magic level at which we can make any confident predictions. But what most of people agree about is firstly that the speed of accumulation of debt in China has been unique. So in 2008, debt to GDP was only about 120% of GDP. In June of 2018, it was probably about 340, 345%. The second thing is that the economy, as I said before, has become increasingly dependent on credit creation and on the explosion in financial assets. This is not always a good thing. Uh, the Japanese boasted about it and came a cropper. The Americans boasted about it and came a cropper. We'll have to see what happens in the Chinese case. But financial assets were about two and a half times GDP in 2008 and they're now over 500% of GDP. <clears throat> so there has been an extraordinary uh, expansion of the financial system, which has gone way beyond what economists call financial deepening. Thirdly, there have been increasingly risky forms, not just of lending, 
but of funding the lending. So banks obviously have to raise deposits in order to make loans. Mostly they raise deposits from you and me and from companies, and sometimes they raise deposits in rather more um, spurious ways, um, not spurious necessarily in terms of being risky, but in more opaque ways, in the interbank market, from non-banking financial institutions, and so on. And this has happened a lot in China. So the smaller banks in China, not the big four or the big five, but small and medium-sized banks now rely about a third of their funding comes from overnight or very, very short maturity uh, lending in the market. <clears throat> There's no historical analogy for a single country's banking system to have expanded as quickly as China's has without leading ultimately to levels of stress and retrenchment. I'm not predicting uh, a financial crisis in China, the like of which we had in 2008, for the very simple reason that China's banking system is state-owned and no major or significant financial institutions will be allowed to go bust, in my view. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that China can escape the consequences of misallocation and of um, bad lending, which uh, has clearly taken place in the last decade. Um, but the way in which that manifests itself is sometimes through liquidity uh, shortages, which one imagines the People's Bank of China would be uh, very quick to meet. Uh, but in, somebody has to pay for the debt eventually. It can never just kind of disappear. And the way it, that people kind of uh, pay for that debt is through a period of a protracted period of, of low growth, the like of which we've seen in the West uh, during the last 10 years. As you know, since the end of 2016, there's been a very significant crackdown on some of the more egregious forms of risk-taking and lending and borrowing, which has resulted in a significant slowdown in the financial sector and in credit growth in some places, particularly for companies. On the other hand, households have been on a tear when it comes to debt. So the ratio of debt, household debt to income has grown from about 87% in 2008 to about 120% now, and it's bigger than it is in the United States. Will this program persevere? We hope, I mean, economists hope that, uh, or I should say that it's churlish, actually, for economists to say they hope it doesn't, because what we all kind of wish on the Chinese authorities is that they will basically bite the bottom lip and allow this period of low growth to evolve so that they can wipe the debt out of the system in a rather orderly transition and orderly way. But the government is clearly very sensitive to still to low rates of growth, and uh, growth is falling in investment, in property, in retail sales, automobile sales, and so on. So it remains to be seen whether the government will push back against this slowdown in growth, bearing in mind that it is still committed to the maintenance of quite high growth targets. It also can't change the ownership structure of the banking system, uh, which aligns incentives and rewards for those that are actually in control. It's like any banking system anywhere in the world. Vested interests always rule. Um, the demographics in China are challenging, as I'm sure you'll know. It's not a very immediate problem um, in the sense of there's going, to be, you know, there's going to be a crisis next year. It doesn't really work like that. But China is the fastest aging country now on the planet. It's not the oldest, which is Japan, um, but it is the fastest aging. And by 2040 or 2050, most of China's demographic metrics will be uh, substantially uh, uh, higher in terms of dependency ratios and support ratios and so on than um, many of its kind of Western counterparts. Part of the problem is the same as everywhere else in the world, that fertility is too low. Uh, it's not so much that people are living longer or being healthier when they retire and, and have uh, longer lifespans in uh, old age, uh, but that the fertility rate is too low. I don't even think the two-child or one-child policy uh, was the principal problem here. Um, but I think that uh, it certainly did lead to a very considerable problem of gender imbalance. But uh, the working age population is declining. The fertility rate is not rising despite the abandonment of the one-child policy and now the two-child policy. Uh, the retirement age is too low. 
Um, there's no immigration to speak of. And um, uh, as the dependency ratio continues to rise inexorably over the next 20 or 30 years, um, you'll see that China will age so much faster than it did we did in the West. So the age structure in China will change in 20 years as fast as it did in the West during the last 100 years. Um, so the phrase, getting old before you get rich, was really invented for China because uh, when China kind of reaches this very advanced stage of aging, its per capita income will be a fraction of what it was for us when we were at the same stage. So they're going to have to obviously ensure that pension of poverty is a problem that is addressed, have to ensure that the social security system is more generous and widespread and so on. Uh, lastly, um, on the middle income trap, I mean, we could talk about this all night. Um, um, I'm only going to mention it for about 30 seconds. Uh, escaping the middle income trap, which is a, an issue which Chinese leaders speak very openly about, um, is something which actually is fundamentally about the quality of your institutions and about um, raising productivity, having a good competitive regulatory uh, rule of law type of environment. I mean, in some of the independent press in China, limited though it is, you can see these arguments being uh, opined quite regularly. Uh, and ultimately, this comes down to institutional change and also to the rate at which China can adapt its own technologies uh, without um, being reliant on the rest of the world, and particularly on the United States. And in this context, maybe the trade war will do China a favor. It's too early uh, to tell. But certainly the emphasis on self-reliance is going to be a very significant factor in the future. And uh, it remains to be seen whether China can overcome uh, quite considerable hurdles to do that. And finally, on trade, um, I just want to kind of say that you know, I don't think this is an ordinary spat um, between the United States and China like the Americans have had with the Japanese, say, in the 1980s. This is much more existential. It's about technology. It's about uh, industrial policies, about the military implications of all of this, and about, obviously, what the Americans charge as being unfair advantage given uh, the policies which China is able to um, conduct uh, for the benefit of state enterprises and private companies that are very closely linked to the state. I think my own view is that China was wrong-footed by Trump. I hate to say this normally, but I think that hubris uh, got the better of Beijing. Uh, and I think they weren't prepared for the uh, vehemence with which uh, Trump has prosecuted this trade conflict. And the tit-for-tat bit is pretty much done, right? So China has already retaliated for, for every dollar that Trump has raised punitive tariffs on China. Um, the Chinese have matched that, but obviously because of the trade imbalance, the Americans can subject the other half of trade with China to punitive tariffs, whereas the Chinese have run out of space. So what are they going to do if the tariffs go up as scheduled or to 25% on the 1st of January and the other half um, uh, fall into the, uh, the realm of tariffs, higher tariffs in due course? It's very difficult to know what the Chinese will do. Um, some people think they will devalue the currency. It's a very dangerous thing to do uh, because actually it's an exercise in self-harm for China as well. Uh, some people think that they'll just sort of turn a little bit harder on the screw in which they target American companies in terms of licensing, customs, procedures, red tape, regulations, and so on, um, which seems to be the more likely to me, but um, we shall have to see. Ultimately, we must all hope that uh, the leadership of both countries recognize that despite the fact that they have differences, big differences, that they can engage in ways in which uh, concessions can be made on both sides uh, concerning issues like access to markets, intellectual property protection, and um, <clears throat> uh, technology transfer. I mean, there's no way that I think the Chinese will give way or concede on what they regard as their sovereign right to be technological leaders in the future, if that's what they choose to do, uh, nor vice versa. So there has to be some give and take, and we must hope that um, that, that is the way in which the relationship kind of evolves. I'm reminded, finally, <clears throat> of a comment uh, that was made by an uh, American political uh, scientist called Edward Lutwak, writing about Japan and Germany in the 1970s. He referred to the trade conflicts that the Americans had at the time as being the logic of conflict in the grammar of commerce. Um, that was with allies. I think that phrase or that phraseology applies really 
aptly to the situation between the US and China, and actually indeed between the West and China, because it's not just the Washington Beltway uh, which actually is involved here, because as we know, these uh, relationships about trade and investment apply also to London and Paris, Berlin, Brussels, and so on. Um, so um, the danger, I mean, I think is that this conflict will linger uh, and that it may spill over into other areas which are not as easily controllable as uh, might be the case with regard to commerce. Thank you very much, uh, George. I'll hand it over now to um, Jonathan. To, uh, up to 15 minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just uh, to pick up on George's uh, last point before I get to the book, uh, my own feeling is that uh, we are getting engaged uh, between the US and China into much more of what I think George at one point referred to as an existential uh, issue and uh, problem there, where it certainly is this the trade war is spilling out far beyond tariffs into strategic military matters, into cyber espionage, into lots of other uh, areas, which uh, from uh, the noises from the United States recently remind somebody as old as myself as the days when we were told to look for reds under the bed. Uh, this is, you know, Trump uh, saying to his golfing buddies at his New Jersey club that all Chinese students are probably spies. Well, uh, you know, that is going quite a long way. He rode back a little bit, but not all that much. Uh, and I read somewhere that um, apparently the CCTV cameras installed in most federal buildings in the United States are supplied by a company which is largely Chinese. Chinese invested, including by the PLA, and there is a congressional investigation to see whether all the film that they are taking is being fed back to Beijing to be examined. I mean, they'll have to employ several million people to do that, I think. Um, to go uh, to George's book, and I don't just say because he's a friend and because he's sitting next to me, uh, but this is an absolutely excellent piece of work, perceptive, well argued, uh, full of information but without the detail becoming overwhelming, and a good read, uh, well written, uh, if I dare say so, for an economist. It is written in very clear terms which uh, <laughs> one can express. Um, as you're probably aware, work uh, on China uh, in recent years has tended to fall into two almost Manichaean camps. There are those who see the economic rise of the People's Republic since 1978 as pointing inevitably towards the 21st century being owned by China, striking a contrast between its model, whatever that may actually uh, be defined as, and messy Western democratic capitalism, especially after the 2008 crisis and the election of Donald Trump. Indeed, there was a contributor to People's Daily early this year who said uh, Western capitalist democracy is in disarray. Now is the moment to seize our advantage. Uh, and that uh, has a considerable uh, echo. On the other hand, there are those who think uh, that China is bound to collapse. The China's impending collapse school has been around since the very beginning uh, of this century uh, with the idea that the flaws in the economic system will inevitably bring about uh, political implosion too. George's book uh, places himself in the middle ground, which is where I think it is sensible to be since I belong there myself, so I would say that, wouldn't I? Although he clearly belongs to its more sceptical wing, as his why she's China is in jeopardy uh, will uh, indicate. Not doomed, China, by any means, and too early to tell uh, in lots of ways, with unknown unknowns uh, involved, but still, I think, uh, on the sceptical side. And this is based um, largely on the four major flaws in China's economy, which uh, George has mentioned now. Uh, and if I might be the devil's advocate for a moment um, to put a slightly counter um, case, which he can shoot down in a minute, uh, the debt mountain is undoubtedly 
big, formidable in its size, but above all formidable in the speed with which uh, it has uh, grown up. But I think there are signs that uh, Liu He, the Xi Jinping's principal economic advisor, uh, who wrote the article, of course, about debt in the People's Daily a couple of years ago now, uh, that he uh, is pushing through a, a, a concerted attempt at um, deleveraging. Uh, how long this will take and how it will work exactly is very difficult to tell given the complexity of the number of means of funding and financing that have been worked out uh, in China over uh, recent years going from the large banks through uh, smaller banks through trust companies uh, into pyramid schemes and straightforward Ponzi uh, scams. Uh, one thing of course on China's side in this is that uh, the debt is very largely domestic and the economy is still subject to capital controls which Yes, you can get money out of China if you really want to, but uh, capital flight has been made more expensive, more difficult. Uh, among other things, there is the OE a little-known OECD um, regulation by which, which China has signed up to, by which in uh, other countries which have signed up to this, it can actually identify bank accounts held by Chinese nationals outside the People's Republic, which, if that gets known, is quite um, a deterrent. Um, there is also the, the state's control over the financial sector, which um, George uh, mentioned. But certainly doing that, uh, deleveraging, or at least controlling the debt and then bringing it down a bit as a percentage of GDP, will uh, involve a uh, slowdown in growth. And we'll come back to that in a minute, because that is growth is in a sense, and the desire for growth, I think, is at the centre of a great number of the challenges and problems China uh, faces uh, today. The currency is a problem, but I think it may have been somewhat overblown, uh, I would say in this devil's advocate uh, mode at any rate, uh, by the fact, the way that China has talked up the internationalisation of the renminbi, as though this meant it was going to become a freely convertible currency and arrival to the dollar. It was not because capital controls will remain in China for as long as there is an undeveloped uh, domestic say, um, investment market uh, and uh, people are putting their money into property. If you, if you lifted capital controls tomorrow, you'd have the biggest property bust the world has ever seen in Beijing, Shanghai uh, and elsewhere. The demographics are indeed a really big uh, long-term problem, along with a lot of other problems which are not mentioned very often, such as the shortage of water uh, in northern China. Um, and I would agree absolutely with George that the main uh, impact of that, the main reason for the demographic, the trend of the demographics has been the fall in fertility, together with more recently the sheer cost of having children, which uh, I think anecdotally puts off quite a lot of uh, younger Chinese uh, who I know. Uh, again, to take a devil's advocate view, you might say, well, actually, if Xi Jinping's uh, social welfare schemes mean anything, you will have the development of a pensions system uh, in China, and with robotization, we'll actually need fewer young people coming into the workforce. This leads to the middle income trap as the culminating point of the list of China's troubles, and one which brings in broader social issues, as well as the strictly economic consideration. And it's here, I think, that the inflection point which George refers to in the book of China's trajectory is likely uh, to lie given the expectations aroused, aroused by growth uh, in recent decades and the way that civil society has been steadily squashed by the increase in communist power. And this brings me to what I think is striking about China's economic model and has become even more uh, the case over the last three years or so, which is the place that it gives to politics. The underlying motivation for Deng Xiaoping's reforms of the late 1970s, I would argue, were basically political, to enshrine the Communist Party as the vehicle by which Chinese people could be made better off. Uh, 
Yes, there was an economic reason for it entirely, but after the Cultural Revolution and Mao, I think Deng's main aim was to make China a great power again and to make the Communist Party the central organ uh, of that strengthening of a power. That succeeded extraordinarily well and enabled the party to strike an implicit bargain with China's people that it would make them better off materially so long as they left the conduct of politics to them. That equation worked pretty well, but it produced a fixation with big growth numbers and initiatives such as the huge credit splurge after 2008, which was greatly celebrated, if we remember, in China at the time by Wen Jiabao, who a couple of years later was talking about the unbalanced uh, and unsustainable nature of the economy. He changed his tune uh, fairly quickly. Um, but under Deng and Jiang Zemin uh, and Hu Jintao, to a large extent, the division was drawn between the party and the management of the economy. And that has been breaking down uh, under Xi Jinping, which comes with a potential cost that I think could be quite important, both, for instance, for the private sector, for the social fabric of the country, and for the development of new technologies, which tend to thrive in a unconstrained or relatively unconstrained environment, rather than under the control of the state, as seems to be uh, the leadership's uh, aim at the moment. So I think Red Flags is an appropriate title for this book, not only because of the way that Red Flags serve as warning signals, but also because Xi Jinping is seeking to put China firmly under the single party banner in place of the more diffuse system uh, pioneered uh, by Deng. And I think that that is where the basic uh, problem uh, is going to lie in China in uh, the years to come, uh, exacerbated probably by the trade war and by the, I think, repressive reaction, which we're going to get to that uh, in internal uh, Chinese politics, with Xi, uh, if we can take his recent statements as any kind of guide, not uh, at all feeling, well, I was guilty of hubris, maybe I overstated uh, where China was and where I thought it was going at the last party congress, maybe I should have moderated uh, my uh, language because now China's got no friends in America, everybody regards us as an enemy. No, there's none of that. It is the party was right. The party was absolutely correct. Its propaganda was on the right lines, and we should do more of the same. And I think that is where a big danger lies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. I think it's absolutely right that you highlight the title is Red Flags in plural, not just singular. Yeah. Over to you, Kerry. Um, so I would like to start by echoing Jonathan in saying it's a great book. Um, so well done, George. Um, very readable and um, very coherent on the challenges that China faces. Um, one of the things that I thought about when I was reading it was, um, I don't know if you've all seen the falling stars images on, on WeChat and on Instagram and so on, where you get kind of crazy, rich, young Chinese kind of parodying themselves, falling out of a sports car or a private plane or down the steps of their penthouse suite and kind of all their kind of it, you know, excessive material goods kind of spreading out in front of them, so all the things they love. I and mean, some of you will be, will be familiar with this, I'm guessing. So you can have your kind of ski gear or your jewels and your bling or your kind of food that you love or whatever. Anyway, so while I was reading George's book, I was thinking, oh, what would Xi Jinping's kind of um, falling star look like? I kind of imagined him kind of spread eagle down the steps of the Great Hall of the People um, with uh, a copy of the governance of China in one hand and um, a glow kind of wound around with the Belt and Road roots in another and, of course, the Communist Party flag um, in front of him. And now I was thinking, well, you know, in what way would that differ from... Um, the falling star image from Mikhail Gorbachev in, you know, 1990, 1991. I mean, we're seven decades into Chinese communist rule, seven decades of, um, of, of Soviet communist rule. I mean, what would that have looked like? And, you know, in some ways he would have had the same kind of stuff lying on the steps in front of him. I think, you know, science, um, maybe the odd rocket, aircraft carrier, 
um, maybe a gulag kind of an image. Of course, China doesn't have any gulag. It has vocational training centers um, in Xinjiang. But, but, but you know, you get, you get my point, really. Some of the stuff is the same. And getting serious again, I suppose, were Xi Jinping here, he would be saying that, of course, it's entirely dissimilar and there is no parallel and he wouldn't do a falling star anyway. And, and if he did, then the content of it would be far more meaningful in GDP terms. You know, the Soviet Union was never a, you know, big power strategic global competitor um, to the US economically. And so the depth and breadth of China's economic advance is enormously uh, significant over the past 40 years uh, in a way that the Soviet Union never did ne never did achieve. However, as George um, and Jonathan have pointed out, we are in a new stage and a new game. And um, China has incontrovertibly benefited enormously from access to um, the American market and to the European market. And if that is now going to be closed off due to the fact that, um, you know, as, uh, as Jonathan pointed out, well, it's not clear that it is. I mean, we haven't got through the midterms yet. So exactly what the Trump game is isn't entirely clear, and it isn't. we haven't seen it played out, and China have may, may have more cards up its sleeve, etc. However, we are definitely in a new newish place, uh, just quite how new still remains to be seen. But as Jack Ma says of Alibaba, you know, we may be looking at the end of this period of history and we may be looking at um, the next 40 years of relying on other things for China's, um, China's growth. And one of the things, obviously, that China says it's going to rely on for its growth and its economic development is itself. I mean, it's going to put a whole big fake full moon over Chengdu. I mean, any country that can do that can surely provide a bit of um, economic momentum at home. And so uh, Xi Jinping himself, he says we have to cast aside illusions, we have to rely on ourselves. Um, and you have a point in China now where innovation is enormously impressive. Um, so is China going to need to steal or extort its way to 21st century technology. Of course, extort is not the language it would use, but that's the kind of language that Trump and Pence and co. use, making the claim that China uh, extorts American high tech in exchange for access to Chinese markets. But it, the, the question remains, really, no matter what language you use, um, can China be self-reliant in terms of 21st century innovation to take it to to take it through the middle income tr the economic challenges of the of the, of the middle income um, trap? You know, you've got the Greater Bay Area in southern China. Um, you've got so many investment opportunities, so many fundamental strengths of the Chinese economy. But is it? enough? Um, and I think, I, I, I can't answer that question. I mean, George addresses the question in the book, but I think he very wisely doesn't attempt to, um, you know, come to any firm conclusions on that either, because there are just too many contingent variables and uncertainties. And we are at a new point in history where no, in China, where no country has been before. And there is no economy of the scale of China's, which is the political, you know, the political economics are set out in the way they are in China. We haven't been here before in history. So anyone who tries to make a, a very firm prediction on where that's headed is, well, in my view, unwise. The other factor that Jack Maher talks about, obviously, is the, um, is the Belt and Road. Um, and that is, um, as, as a new um, engine of Chinese economic growth, and that, I mean, it's not new, I suppose, but, but, but in that kind of construction and framing, it is new. And the scale of the ambition is... Uh, new if it's to be if, if it's to be believed, but I think at the end of the day, you know whether you look at China's domestic market or whether you look at the um, Belt and Road markets and the challenges there. I think some of the interesting things that um, George was saying and Jonathan was was chiming in on on the um, on the capital allegation allocation is is very critical really um, because China doesn't have, and this does relate back, in my view, to its politics, it doesn't, and, and its absence of um, open discussion as well, it doesn't really have very um, effective ways of assessing value. Um, and therefore, it, it is going to end up misallocating 
resources of all kinds, um, whether it's doing that domestically or whether it's doing that uh, on the Belt and Road. And you, you, if you have an increasingly monopolistic information structure and the kind of digital authoritarianism that China is headed in the direction of, um, it's very hard to see how that is going to make um, you know, effective decisions about about allocation of many things in life. I find that very puzzling. So when I think about China's future, you know, there's so many inspiring things, but there's also this is a, is a great worry, I think. Um, and, and as Jonathan says, if you lifted the capital controls tomorrow, you'd get a, you'd get a property bust. I mean, the fact is the economy is not worth what it says it is. Um, if, 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 the, if you lifted capital controls, you get a property bust. It means that nobody really believes those assets are, are worth what you know, the price on them, it's, it's a confidence trick. It's a big short. Um, or is it? I mean, I'm not an economist, so George will tell me whether, whether it's right or wrong. But this is the kind of thing that, that worries me about, about, about the future. Uh, George says, um, you know, the task for Xi Jinping is to um, establish a new contract for the party with a sophisticated uh, citizenry. But, it, but it's difficult when... The party is the biggest vested interest in Chinese society. How can it be responsive to the needs of others? So even if you say, oh, this is going to be a totally different experience from the last totalitarian dictator we had in China, we're not going to have another Chairman Mao here because the feedback loop loops are so sophisticated now. We aren't going to have any of the problems that we had in the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution uh, because we have AI and big data and all the rest of it. Well, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not convinced of. I'm not convinced of that either. I think it's very hard for a vested interest, a political vested interest, which is not accountable to anyone, to actually be responsive. And so, I mean, many of you will have noticed what Fan Bingbing. You know, you know the Chinese big film star, where she disappeared for a couple of three months, I think it was. And you know, when she finally reappeared, crawling on humiliated hands and knees. Um, she said, you know, without the Communist Party, there would be no Fan Bingbing. And that is kind of the point, you know, and that's somebody who's like about the biggest star in China. Without the Communist Party, there is no Fan Bingbing. So if you have a society like that, where the citizenry have no legitimacy, distinct from the party, you know, there is no China without the party, there is no citizen without the party, then there is no nothing without the party, then the party is not accountable to anybody, then you are not going to get a good contract between the party and a sophisticated citizenry. Or if you are, I can't quite see how it's going to happen. And because of that, I worry about you know, all the cascading other relationships through the economy, because at the end of the day, you know, we need those contracts to function. They have to be meaningful. And if the party doesn't have to have really, at the end of the day, a very meaningful contract with anyone, how can the cascade contracts which cascade from that be meaningful either? So I found George's book really fascinating. I think the questions are vital. I think he's right not to draw any firm conclusions because it's, it, it's hard, especially in the context of this um, you know, huge inflection point in terms of US-China that we see in, in China and the world. Um, but I, 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 I suppose... I suppose I too am somewhere in the middle, middle. I'm not a China collapsist, but I'm not a China triumphalist either. I think there are many, there are many huge questions which remain unanswered. Thank you very much, Kerry. If there's no Communist Party paraphrasing, uh, Kerry paraphrasing Fan Bingbing, if there's no Communist Party, then there is no red flag. But since there is the Communist Party in charge in China, there are red flags, at least for the book. And so perhaps um, we should be all going and grab a copy and read it. Now, um, before I open it to the floor for questions and answers, uh, George, is there anything you'd like to respond to, to the two reviews? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank both Carrie and Jonathan for, uh, A, for being here, um, and also for their very um, incisive and um, uh, kind comments. Um, uh, not really. I mean, there, there, Jonathan raised some points. Uh, um, he said, as devil's advocate, most of which I could probably e agree with very easily. 
um, particularly when it comes to debt. I mean, it, the, the, the distinguishing feature, of course, about China's debt issue is that it is domestic debt. It's not owed to foreigners, by and large, uh, which makes it materially different from the situation surrounding uh, you know, Thailand, South Korea, uh, Indonesia in the Asian crisis, or Turkey, Argentina this year, and so on and so forth. Materially different. But of course, that doesn't mean to say that countries that only have a domestic debt issue don't have problems. So in the 1930s, the America's debt problem was a domestic one. In the savings and loan um, crisis the Americans had in the 1980s, it was a domestic debt problem. In the financial crisis in 2008, it was a domestic debt problem. In Japan in the 1980s, it was a domestic debt problem. So countries that have large and unsustainable levels of domestic <laughs> debt also have uh, a day of reckoning, um, but not one that can be brought about by foreigners, uh, by foreign capital, because there's no foreign capital effectively to withdraw. So <clears throat> it, it manifests itself in different ways. The triggers are very different, uh, and, and they can be extended and, and, and lengthened. So um, if you have a kind of opaque accounting systems, you can, you can hide bad loans. You can do what bankers call extend and pretend, which is basically is to push the maturities or the, uh, the payments on loans out you know, years into the future so that nobody recognizes a bad debt uh, you know, for the time being. Etc. Etc. So uh, the, the timing it is a mugs game. Nobody, nobody's going to be able to do it. But we know that eventually, you know, countries do run out of wiggle room. Um, and I think um, um, I don't know. I, I mentioned in the introduction of the book that the Shanghai Tower, which is the tallest, going to be the tallest building, I think, uh, well, certainly in China, if not in the world, it may still be the. Um, um, uh, the, bar, the Dubai Tower, I'm not there's quite sure. There's always one. There's always one, isn't there? Um, but actually, so... They'll add an extra. <laughs> there's a bit of folklore about the topping out of tall buildings, yeah. right, which is usually kind of a tipping point. It may not be quite the tipping point that the new 50p piece in the United Kingdom will be. Um, but, um, but anyway, I think that that kind of time for China is kind of drawing near. It's certainly nearer than it was, you know, five years ago and ten years ago. Uh, ten years ago, perhaps it wasn't even a problem. But speed of debt accumulation, etc. cetera. Uh, the other thing, actually, I thought I'd quickly mention, actually, because I thought it was a really good point that Carrie made about how... Um, I'll write it down here. That actually doesn't have very efficient ways of assessing value. Um, that's really, really an interesting um, point, it's certainly for an economist to kind of consider, because actually, of course, where everything is state-directed and state-controlled and top-down mandated, because you, there isn't a question of value. You just, you know, you can do anything you like until you can't. Um, and then eventually, you know, you do get found out. Um, if you introduce um, a blended system or, you know, markets with Chinese characteristics or uh, whatever you want to call it, then you start to introduce something which actually makes that system a little bit more sustainable, which is effectively what, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the black cat and the yellow cat under, you know, Deng Xiaoping was all about, was introducing kind of a blended system. Um, which, which actually underlies, you know, the success that China has had for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, the question also then now is, Kaji, is whether we've kind of reached a little bit of the end of the road in a way or reaching the end of the road because there are, you know, because for reasons that we've heard from, you know, on all of the table this, this evening, um, uh, the, the political system has kind of reached a point where the private sector is basically being kind of pushed aside a little bit. Um, there was a sort of very kind of um, curious incident uh, taking place in China in the last few weeks in the stock market, which has been falling very, very um, substantially, <clears throat> where private companies that weren't able to get loans uh, from banks because of the priorities uh, attributed or assigned to state companies um, had to pledge shares in order to um, to get loans. Well, of course, once the stock market starts falling, the value of the collateral collapses, which means that the companies become more and more uh, you know, commercially unviable. And several companies actually have had to sell stakes back to state companies or themselves completely back to uh, one or two state companies. These are not widespread yet uh, by any means, and the stock market certainly seems to have stabilized for the time being. But I think the, you know, the, the assignation of value actually requires all sorts of structural and legal changes, which I think defy 
basically the China that we know. You can't, you know, the, chi the Chinese government is, or the Chinese state is the owner, the participant, and the regulator in the system. They have a huge conflict of interest. And um, it's very difficult to kind of make that blended system work in complex economies, I think, um, unless you have clarity, um, which actually allow you to assign value and to write it off when it's un unvaluable. So very, very good point, which I think um, we should think about. Thank you, George. The floor is open, and I will try to take a couple of questions first before asking George to respond. And if you would like to address this to um, one or the other uh, panelists, don't feel uh, discouraged from doing so. Anyone? Yes. I think we have a roving mi yeah, microphone, and if you could wait for the microphone to catch to you. Thanks very much. Um, do you, I think you already sort of addressed this in the in a way in you said that you saw this the trade war as having sort of spillover into into other areas that would be difficult to contain. Do you see um, this trade war as a sort of precursor to a sort of wider kind of tech technology war? Um, I'm thinking in particular about the the US's offset strategy, where it sort of explicitly makes a link between its sort of technological preeminence and its strategic security, um, and that. We're seeing, with the advent of AI, the sort of um, a sort of confluence into between commerce and and strategy, where um, advancements in these areas, which are important for um, for, for for commercial um, activity, are also very important um, potentially for you know, in the strategic realm. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you. I think there's another question. Was it? Yeah, I'll take two at together. Okay. Um, uh, I'm a long-term human rights activist and it's never ceased to amaze me how much abuse of its own people the dictatorship in China has heaped over the last 60 or 70 years. Can the panel ever see a time, and I know that there is a deep cultural um, preference within China for stability at almost any cost, but can the panel ever see a time when, uh, especially under the increasingly authoritarian policies of Xi Jinping, when um, the social contract between um, party and government and the people um, starts to break down into significant internal disturbance, which would probably um, have already happened in most other countries in the world had they been subjected to what the government has um, done to them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, George, will China become a tech war? Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. It's an easier question. but um, <laughs> um, No, well, I think, you know, the, I think you nailed it, really. I mean, I think that's the point that I was trying, trying to make. Uh, I'll try and make it better now. That the trade war really, I mean, yes, ostensibly it is about commerce, but underneath it's about much bigger things, which are to do with... Well, the reason, or amongst the reasons that the White House has cited <clears throat> uh, for the implementation of punitive tariffs, which I'm not saying is the right way to go about it, but that's kind of where we are, um, is the are uh, things like uh, the China's policy called Made in China 2025, um, which uh, identifies ten sectors. Which uh, in which the, each of these sectors are given quantitative targets to achieve certain kind of much higher levels of market share in terms of um, of sales and you know revenues, um, and um, uh, that was basically followed very quickly um, in 2016, 2017, with a series of state council documents um, that had to do with um, what China wanted to achieve in terms of AI and robotics, big data, by 2030, 2035, and so on. So um, the problem, well, the issue that the Americans and others have with, uh, with this is they think that um, China's industrial policies and its technology transfer policies and its intellectual property policies are unfair and give undue advantage to uh, local companies, obviously, and to the Chinese government because they are actually you know, state companies or private companies that are very closely related to the state. Um, and, and that's fundamentally what it's about. And I mean, if it, if it was like, um, you know, if it was just about iPhones or something like that, I don't think anybody would really care too much. Um, but this is ultimately, this is about power and about military capacity. So 
Yeah, I think if I could just add to that, that, I mean, if you look back over what Peter Navarro, particularly at the White House, has written, it's always been about technology and, and when it's not about postal rates, <laughs> which he's also very exercised about. Um, but it's been about technology. And I think the whole ZTE episode, which really showed up how backward China was in this, in a sense acted as an encouragement to the Trump administration to push things further with making it more difficult for Chinese acquisitions um, and technology uh, in, in the US. Uh, and that will continue. And what is important, which George mentioned, um, is that you know so much of this is, is, is going into military use and where the, the boundaries are between civilian and military use is very cloudy everywhere, but particularly in China. I think so yes it's a technology thing and the interesting thing from that point of view will be how countries suppliers of technology for instance South Korea which is the biggest supplier of semiconductors to China or Japan Abe was just in uh, there with a big business de uh, delegation last week in Beijing whether they will supply China with advanced technology or whether Trump will tell them South Korea and Japan, hey, if you want the American market, you better stop collaborating with or selling into China. So it can broaden out. A uh, very brief question to yours. I, I don't think there's ever going to be any change from the, the Communist Party leadership there. It's uh, on the human rights side. I think that is now said. It may be deplorable in every way, but you know what's happening in Xinjiang at the moment is a very good example, I think, of you know pushing things as far as they can, and in terms, you know, getting away with it, I think. Kerry, um, social contract, will it ever break down? Um, I think, I, I mean, I basically agree with Jonathan. I think that the scale of China and the um, means and the scale of the party means that uh, it's very hard to imagine the circumstances in which the social contract, you know, in, in which there would be a very significant difficulty uh, for the party or in which the party would have to be forced to adjust uh, that position. Because, of course, the whole way it operates is for you, the citizen, to feel that it, the party, is absolutely inexorable and invincible. And in order to maintain that fiction, um, it has to behave inexorable and invincible, and that involves intimidating you. So, I mean, we saw it in the summer with, there were two academics, some of you will be aware, one, one uh, was courageous enough to criticize the Belt and Road. He got carted off in the middle of an interview he was doing with VOA. Um, and I mean, it wasn't even a very out there criticism of the Belt and Road, but he uh, dared to criticize the PET project, so that was enough. And then um, the other, I mean, the other, the other was, um, I actually wrote the quote down, uh, quote down to read to you all, actually, um, from um, Professor Xu at, um, at Tsinghua, I said, and he said, I mean, it, it, in a way, it speaks directly to what, what you're asking. He um, wrote uh, a criticism, really, of the whole Xi Jinping project um, and the extension on two terms presidency, etc., and one line, for example, people nationwide, including the entire bureaucratic elite, feel once more lost in uncertainty about the direction of the country and about their own personal security. And the rising anxiety has spread into a degree of panic throughout society, he said. But that's, that's two people in, you know, to 1.4 billion. Um, so most people wouldn't dream of daring to, to, to say anything like that. It, and, and that means that Xi Jinping really does control the narrative. And if you control the narrative, you can get away with saying that locking up a million people in Xinjiang, if that, if indeed we don't know exactly how many, but obviously those, that's the upper end of the estimate. Um, you can get away with saying that's vocational training. Who's, who's going to contradict you? Um, so, you know, within China, what 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 is the contract between the citizen and the state currently? Fear, greed, and patriotism slash nationalism. And um, you know, it's interesting that Donald Trump's obviously going the same way in terms of American politics. In the old days, you know, early 1990s, dark days in China, but but many Chinese citizens had, had this sense that there was a a different kind of society out there, one that 
you might wish to aspire to and that provided an alternative model. At the moment, my experience from having been in China, you know, between 2014, 15, 16, 17, so really throughout the American election, presidential election campaign in the first year of Trump, was that um, already after 2008 and, you know, after the Afghan war, the Iraq war, um, the Arab Spring, the 2008 financial crisis, there were a lot of dents being knocked into the aspiration inside Chinese citizenry for, um, you know, for, for, to, to follow the, the Western example. But certainly Donald Trump has kind of, you know, been the last nail in that coffin, I, I would say. So at the moment, I don't think people in China feel that they've got much of an alternative anyway. Having said that, I believe that the dangers, if I was Xi Jinping, the thing that would keep me up at night are, one is the... Um, the uh, bursting of the property bubble that, that Jonathan talked about a moment ago, I think that would really cause him a lot of problems in terms of the social contract. And another thing is um, military defeat. You know, if China lost a, lost a, a, a little war that it intended to win, um, that would be very humiliating for the party and that would be uh, the kind of damage to legitimacy that would be very problematic for him, I think. Anyway. Thank you. Um, Great. I think that uh, lady there first, yes. Again, I will uh, collect a couple of questions and then have them answer together. Yes, the lady there. If you can raise your hand so that the mic can come to you. Well, thank you for your excellent talk. Well, my question is in a word. Do you think the red flag includes the territory stability in, in China? Because I think that that problem you previously mentioned is closely related to the tremendous spending on um, maintaining stability, or in Chinese, Wei Wen, especially in Xinjiang province, but also in the rest of the country. So if the government failed to uh, address the debt problem, and if the central government is no longer able to afford a high level of surveillance, will it lead to some internal chaos or even the eventual secession of certain areas in China in the long term? And that's my question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, I think if you just give it to the uh, gentleman. In, yes. Hello. Well, uh, this is a, uh, a kind of follow-up to uh, the last question by the human rights activist. A question to George that, uh, if I uh, heard you correctly, you mentioned four internal factors uh, which you think will contribute uh, to the ultimate uh, collapse or demise of uh, Xi Jinping's China. Why is it that uh, you did not uh, mention the most important factor, which is the repression of the Chinese people? Why it, 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 sh it should have been the first, I think, least of all you didn't mention it at all? H how is it? I mean, this should be the first factor, that it is a repressive regime, and that will eventually, I mean, if you have any faith in human beings, you should mention it. And if even if you don't have, you should at least mention that this factor is there. You can say, I don't have any hope about it. Yes, but at least do mention, please. Okay. Um, I'll take, take one, one more. Uh, sorry. Uh, actually, I don't have a question, but uh, uh, I do not completely agree with Professor George about his answer regarding to the first question um, about the trade war, um, the current trade war between China and the United States. Um, professor, um, sorry, um, you say that uh, the trade war is uh, not simple, uh, the current trade war between China and the United States is not simply the, the, the issue of trade, but um, related to a lot of um, other matters. Um, but, you said, uh, but you said that um, the only focus on uh, trade, uh, uh, apart from trade, uh, you focus on the technologies, uh, uh, China forced uh, uh, foreign entrepreneurs to 
transfer technology in order to operate in China or something like that. But I think um, China is only a small point in a, in a large picture. I think, uh, I mean, that is strategic competition now between China and the US. That's a strategic competition. And so what is the question, please? No, I don't question. As I said before, but I want to um, simply um, clarify that um, clarify that um, uh, mis uh, clarify as um, and um, let's and then the mis clarify the answer of uh, Professor Zhou to the um, first question related to trade wars. Yeah, but I I, I, I do not completely agree with your answer, so I. I will. I could make more comments about that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll try to see whether I can get another round in. Uh, George, it, it's, it's a little bit curious actually, because you say you don't agree with my answer, but actually I agree with what you said. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so what I was trying to say, perhaps inarticulately, uh, was actually the trade conflict is like a tip of an iceberg. So you say it's really about strategic competition. I think that's what you said, in strategic competition, but in areas that go far beyond trade. Yeah, yes, in all areas, in yeah. all spheres. And so I agree with that. It's kind of what I was trying to say. So, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, on the, on the, I, I'm not really sure. I should pass the territories issue to my two colleagues, actually. And the other question really was about um, Oh, about why didn't I mention repression? Um, well, uh, because, um, I mean, I, I do refer in the book to the nature of the governance system, right, that's, ha that's happened since 2012, and that it has become repressive, and, you know, that human, well, I don't talk specifically about human rights, but I do talk about the legitimacy of government, which, you know, up until now has really been aspiring or helping people aspire to ever rising living standards and prosperity and so on. And that could be undermined, as we've already discussed here this evening, could be undermined, of course, uh, under lots of different circumstances, including, as Carrie pointed out, uh, you know, if property prices should suddenly tumble for one reason or another, or military defeat, as she pointed out. Um, it, from an economics point of view, which is I'm, I've written the book as an economist rather than as a political philosopher, which I'm not, um, you know, the issue of repression is, uh, uh, I mean, it's not unimportant, of course, but actually from the point of view of economic success or economic failure, it, it's not really the kind of numero uno kind of topic because it, it is a topic if the legitimacy of the social contract breaks down, which is, and that's the topic that I've kind of tried to, topics I've tried to address, which is why might that break down? I'm not looking for a collapse of the communist regime, by the way. Uh, or the collapse of, um, of Xi Jinping. I mean, he may be undermined by other factions in the Communist Party if something should go wrong, because the concentration of power around him means that he's safe as long as everything is right. But if everything, something goes wrong, which it's very likely to do at some point, then he's personally liable, uh, as we've already kind of made clear. But I don't really, you know, I'm not trying to minimize the issue of repression. It's a terrible thing, you know, obviously. But, you know, um, opinion surveys such as they are, uh, in China actually indicate quite high levels of satisfaction with the president. And um, that's because, by and large, you know, people still don't feel any immediate threat to their prosperity living standards. But maybe that's a rather, you know, narrow way to look at it. I think there's one more question, to George, which is about the relationship between debt and stability maintenance. Oh, uh, I missed the sense of the question. But, I mean, the, the management of the debt situation, I mean, is kind of, it's really, it's central to the sustainability of stability um, in China. So if you if you lost control of that situation because illiquidity began to uh, appear in the financial system or because um, uh, people that supplied funds to the interbank market or to, you know, sophisticated financial products suddenly withdrew their money because of lack of confidence or because property prices started to drop, um, yeah, that, that would breed instability quite quickly, which would spread uh, like wildfire. So it's, it's really, it, it, you know, it's on, it's a kind of a, it is a tipping point kind of issue uh, to maintain the stability of the financial system. If you can't do that, then you've kind of lost the, you've lost that battle, really. Right. I'll press on. Uh, if we could have the microphone back. Yes. Uh, 
have the lady there. Um, we are sort of rather underrepresented in terms of questions from ladies. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong, so I would like to feedback a bit uh, about Carrie's point about the Greater Bay and the Belt and Road projects because you you see the re reason like reject or uh, backing out from some African country and Malaysia about the Belt and Road project, uh, and also for the Greater Bay area. Uh, the central government makes Hong Kong to spend one trillion. Uh, it's almost equal to uh, one million, one hundred billion pounds uh, to build a man-made island that Hong Kong doesn't need as a money laundry process for the uh, government control, the central government control, the construction company to capture the money. And will all these factors uh, um, add up some more uh, red flags to you to? Uh, to reassess the ticking time for for the burst of this economic bubble, or uh, how how far is it coming? In five years, ten years, or okay. Yeah. I th now, if you can hand the mic to the gentleman in front of you, yes. Hi there. It's a conflation of both uh, Carrie's question, and George's question. That firstly, with George, the first red flag of aging. Um, is that something in my reading I've come across is the average age of a farmer now is 57 in China. And then it goes on to your point that you're saying that the watershed moments, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, you could see potentially repeating themselves. Do you think there's a situation that China has an imminent kind of food security crisis? Okay. Um, I think this, uh, you could move the mic to the front, right to the front. Yes, can you, if you can pass the microphone, please. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, just one general question. Do you think this whole agenda of tightening control and strengthening state power uh, only as a correspondence to the incoming economic crisis like Roosevelt government in the 1930s, or is it also with a party incentive to come back to stage with a ever, as an ever stronger organ. But if the case is the first case, it will be much uh, much easier to apprehend than the, the party is trading off some values uh, with the citizen. But if it is the second case, it could, it could be more complicated. It can be implied that in the future there is no incentive to loosen the control. Right, thank you. Um Carol, would you like to go first, and then I come back to George for both. The, uh, um, so I'll just go very, very quickly because, but I think mostly these are questions for George. Um, but um, I'm interested in, you know, that 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 question about whether um, the motivation is purely because China faces these very challenging, economic, urgent economic ticking time bombs that George has set out, um, whether that's the motivation entirely for Xi Jinping's control push uh, or whether it's other things. And, and as you say, um, if it is other things, then maybe they don't have the same incentive to quit being so controlling if they ever get through solving their economic problems. And I would say, no, it's more than the economic issues. It would be my take on them. There's obviously a huge question, and it, we, we could take all evening to discuss it. But I think it is, um, there are many other factors involved in that. I think Xi Jinping's got some of that control instinct in his political, philosophical DNA. Um, and I also think that, you know, those corruption problems weren't nothing that the, the, the Chinese Communist Party had before he took over in 2012. Very, very significant corruption. And so the the kind of, you know, let's put some calcium back in the spine of this organization. Let's let's get some coherent values. I mean, you may not like his values, but he's certainly driving them down through the, through the party, and that means through the society. Um, and so... I think the short answer to your question is it's much more than economic, although economic is the bit that many Chinese people might think is legitimate, um, and that even if he ever gets through George's you know, long list, to-do list, he is not going to renounce that control. Um, Carrie, there was a question that was specifically directed towards you, which is the first one, about the... Um, the Baron Low initiative oh, yeah. putting Hong Kong the Well, I still think that's kind of I'm gonna kick that ball to George basically okay. because I, I I I I don't know is the answer. I mean I mean yes, I think it's fairly cynical. 
um, to a degree, and we've seen it in, you know, we see it in many of the Belt and Road projects, the kind of, you know, who's cement factory, who's steel plant, you know, we've got to find jobs for the boys. Um, and so there's definitely some of that going on. And if it's going on in Hong Kong, you know, well, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. So I'm, I'm not, and it's again back to this question of, you know, if there isn't a sensible allocation, if there isn't, if we haven't got any other uh, means of resource allocation effectively, then unfortunately you get all kinds of um, logic for allocating resources, which are not ones that you as a citizen of Hong Kong might choose. Okay, I think Jonathan would like to come in and yeah. then come to you. No, no, I think also the Hong Kong thing, you've got to put it in the context of, and actually since the <clears throat> State Council white paper of what now, four or five years ago, however long it was, you know, there has been a definite move to draw Hong Kong closer into the People's Republic. I mean, the one country, two systems, I remember at the time being there, uh, and handover time, everybody thought about the second part of the, the two systems. But now Beijing has made it quite clear that one country comes first, and that's going to be the belt, you know, the greater delta area or whatever I think Beijing wants. And you can see it in all kinds of uh, ways there. I'd say also just to get to go to uh, introduce one element which we haven't mentioned, which applies to human rights and a lot of the other issues that have been raised, which is the absence. <coughs> of an independent rule of law in China and accountability there, which I think underlies an awful lot uh, of these problems and actually affects quite a lot of the economic mm. problems too because it makes all the kind of skullduggery and you know, inefficiencies that we've uh, mentioned along the way uh, easy if you've got uh, political cover, uh, cover. And to come finally to Xi Jinping, I think the the most telling, perhaps early, statement of his <coughs> was right at the beginning in 2012 when, I paraphrase it roughly, that when the challenge came in the Soviet Union, there was nobody strong enough to defend the party and the system. And since he sees the party as being absolutely primordial, he is quite sure that he is going to be the person who will be there to prevent a Soviet Union style collapse and I think that dictates an awful lot whether that is pure you know power accumulation for power accumulation's sake or in the sen in the sake of a greater good as he would no doubt put it <laughs> I'll leave you to decide <laughs> George yeah well I must be brief um, but um, yeah I mean I just I agree obviously with both of my co-panelists have said to uh, your question here at the front um, I mean, there was a point when people thought that the concentration of power around Xi Jinping was really quite deliberate uh, and designed to uh, make sure that as the party was strengthened, that um, local governments and provincial governments and state-owned enterprise um, executives would be more compliant. So you need to be, you know, ruthless and powerful and show who's boss because otherwise people won't obey you know, the center. Um, so to believe that that, the other part of that belief, you have to believe that underneath it all, that Xi Jinping actually is a liberal reformer, which I don't think he is. So there was a point, you know, during the third plenum, wasn't there? Where well, there was a famous New York Times column saying when Xi Jinping took over in 2012, yeah. this is the beginning of liberalization and democracy in China. You know, this is going back to Bill Clinton, make them rich and they'll be more like us. Yeah. Uh, so I think it is endogenous to his beliefs and to Xi Jinping thought, socialist characteristics, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Uh, The Greater Bay Area, I, I think it was quite interesting, actually. I, I mean, from, I think it's a white elephant, right? Because ec just from an economic point of view, you, there doesn't seem to be any need at all for that bridge uh, that was recently opened, uh, given all the high-speed rail projects that are going on and the improvement in rail and road infrastructure. Um, but, you know, it's a huge engineering feat, and I'm sure that a lot of, as you said, you know, construction companies made a lot of nice money out of it and so on and so forth. And uh, whether it'll, you know, I mean, as far as I could tell, uh, reading the South China Morning Post, I mean, it looks like, you know, there's not going to be very much traffic on it and you have to apply. Yeah. It's very complicated to apply the licenses and you so on. You apply two weeks in a Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it is 
it's kind of another example, if you want. I mean, I don't want to be too churlish about this, because actually if you're a poor country and Chinese banks come, or de policy development banks come and say, you know, we'll build you a new airport or we'll build you new highways or we'll do high-speed rail, I mean, what's not to like, really, unless unless it bankrupts you or the, you end up having to sign over your port, uh, you know, to um, Chinese construction company. But um, so it's a bit sort of nuanced, really. Uh, but it is another example, actually, of the kind of, you know, lots of kind of glitz and, you know, wow factor. Uh, but actually, the commercial underpinnings, the value of these kinds of projects, you know, sometimes very questionable. And uh, interesting that, sorry, just yeah, no, uh, as far as I can see from John, reading Jonathan, you think that, that <laughs> she didn't actually open it himself. Oh, right. okay. uh, and the last question was, um, you asked a question about, uh, food, about the rural population. No, I think, you know, the, I mean, I, I don't really know about food security. I mean, I, I know, uh, and one of the things that I didn't really address in, in the book, really, was the issue of, apart from repression, which the gentleman asked me about before, uh, but was the, was the issue about, you know, climate change and environmental damage and so on and so forth. So, uh, I mean, I know that China, I mean, it, you know, it has actually, be, it has lost a bit of its food security because it now imports, I think, almost all of its kind of soy uh, needs. Um, and uh, uh, I, I've looked, I mean, I've looked at the rural population from the point of view of labor transfer, right? So people still say there are, you know, half the population live in the countryside, uh, roughly, uh, and that China has this ambition, you know, to go from 50% urbanized to 75% urbanized by, you know, 2030, 2040. But the trouble is that, the, I mean, that assumes that the population of the rural areas is the same now as it was 20, 30 years ago, which of course it isn't, because it's much older and, uh, and, and its gender composition has changed because a lot of women who went to work in factories have kind of gone back to take on, you know, family care and so on and so forth. Uh, so the um, the mobility of labour from the rural side is less than it used to be. This is just an age-related thing, um, and um, so I think that that is the problem. Uh, I mean, it could be a food issue. I, I don't really know, to be honest. We are now into the uh, drinks reception time, but I noticed that there was quite a bit of interest earlier. So I am quite happy to have one last round of three questions if you are still interested. Okay. Take it on uh, on this side, please. I think the gentleman in the middle first, and then we'll go from there. Hi there. I was wondering if the panel could um, speak more to, I think it was kind of briefly touched on, but I think it's a really important point about the, the gender imbalance in China and the links that that might have with militarism and also kind of expansionism. Because um, kind of thinking about history, the last time that the major power in Asia had this much of a gender imbalance was when Genghis Khan kind of spread around kind of Europe and Asia to want for one reason to find more wives for young men with no jobs. So <coughs> well with AI and all those things comes from the gender balance and militarism. Thank you. If you could pass it to the gentleman next to you. Um, Thank you for the interesting discussion so far. I would like to evoke one question related to the trade side. Uh, so one thing that hasn't been mentioned is that uh, China holds quite a pile of US uh, government debt, and it's said that it's kind of suicidal that China would evoke this aspect. But in what conditions or what kind of uh, leverage China would have when it, it would use this kind of uh, aspect, and what would basically happen if China would be pressed to kind of do something to manage the trade, trade situation? Okay, thank you. I think I'll take one, one more. Uh, yes, you could pass uh, to, to your uh, back. Thank you. Uh, I have some question about the middle class in China, because uh, I've been reading an article from The Economist saying Xi Jinping is very hostile to the middle class in China right now. Uh, I'm kind of agree with this opinion, because there used to be a period that's right after 1978, where the boom of the private business giving rise to the middle class in China. And now what is happening in China is, it seems to be a re-emphasis of the importance of state-owned business. And a lot of the government policy uh, is inclined in favor of state-owned business because, well, I mean, my parents have the private business owner in China. We can feel that kind of thing happening, this tendency. Uh, that it is said by some people that the approach of Xi Jinping is to control several big private business in China, so such as Alibaba, Tencent, or, or Jindong, and then 
take a very repressive approach against the middle class and then leaving a lot of people still living in the base level where they can be highly indoctrinated and brainwashed. Uh, that's the way that he can adopt to strengthen the power of the Communist Party. So what's your opinion on this issue? What do you think okay, the, I think we got the message. of the middle class yeah, will be in the future? Thank you. Um, George, why don't you start with... Um, well, I'll, I'll certainly take the middle question um, uh, about about U.S. Treasuries. I mean, the, the China does hold a lot of U.S. Treasuries, uh, less than it did. And in fact, during the financial crisis that China had in 2015-16, its reserves dropped by about $800 billion. Um, and you would barely have noticed it if you were looking at the U.S. Treasury market. Partly because the U.S. Treasury market is influenced by all sorts of things, uh, not only you know who happens to own it, as who, which foreign governments uh, happen to own it. Um, nowadays, it might be a different issue because the U.S. Treasury market itself is under a lot of pressure because American Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, the economy is quite robust, and so on. Um, so, bond the bond market isn't very uh, isn't very stable at the moment, but. Um, uh, it's an old chestnut, this one. I've, I've been around this corner many, many times in the last kind of 10 or 15 years. And uh, the issue has always been that China wouldn't really sell its stock of U.S. Treasury bonds unless it wanted to be really send out a really aggressive signal to, uh, to Washington about its intentions, by which time, you know, one imagines that the Americans would have kind of latched onto this. Uh, and it's also an exercise in self-harm, really, because <clears throat> uh, they hold, uh, so Chinese reserves are about $3 trillion, uh, probably at least two-thirds of that, if not more, uh, in, in, in US, uh, US bonds or US Treasury bills, probably more if you include currency holdings as well. So once you start selling, if uh, people start getting panicky about it and they start, you know, joining in with the Chinese in terms of selling, then the, the value of Chinese assets goes down automatically. So, And the reserves are actually looked at in China as a kind of a, a little bit of a status symbol. You know, we've earned this. You know, it's ours and it's, you know, we have to protect it and so on. So I, I think that's a kind of a, uh, a false threat, actually. I don't think the Chinese would do that. Um, things would have to get pretty desperate for them to do that, let's put it like that. Um, I, I'm going to pass on gender imbalance and militarism. I don't really know anything about that. <laughs> Well, um, perhaps Kerrigan. Well, I'll, I'll deal with that briefly, and I'll leave the third question to Jonathan then. Um, so, but uh, unless it was, I, I don't have much to say about gender imbalance and Genghis Khan and uh, militarism, except um, that um, you know, if Genghis Khan was an early version of toxic masculinity, then um, Xi Jinping needs to be a little bit, you know, careful not to go the same way. And obviously, we can all see how gender balanced the top of the Chinese Communist Party is. Um, and if the state, you know, wants to get compliance from Chinese women on the things that it cares about, I mean, we talked earlier about fertility, um, and someone was making the point, the very obvious point, that, you know, it's enormously expensive uh, financial, in terms of financial investment, but also human resource investment, you know, time uh, investment, the way that Chinese now bring up their kids, it's tending towards the kind of Japanese model. Um, so, um, so I don't really have anything to say, and I'll stop talking, except to say, um, you know, women are an interesting quantity in China, and... Uh, You'll remember the Feminist Five in 2015 and the detention of those feminists um, in the spring of 2015, which was kind of just a couple of months before Xi Jinping went to mark the anniversary of the uh, Beijing Women's Conference. It was the 20th anniversary. And instead of that being a kind of happy, clappy moment for him, um, you know, Hillary Clinton pointed out that it was shameful that he was you know, taking credit for this at the same time as locking up a few feminists who had merely been trying to say, can we not be groping people on public transport, which you wouldn't have thought was a very challenging point. Um, so that kind of underlying Me Too kind of energy in China, the kind of Me Too of Chinese women who identify with the same challenges of the, uh, of women elsewhere in the world and yet are unable to talk about it because they're gabbed by the political control mechanism which doesn't even acknowledge them um, throughout the Chinese Communist Party I mean, or in its higher reaches 
I, I think it's interesting. We'll see where it goes, but um, I don't. I don't have any short answer. Jonathan, yes, Xi, Jin, yes, Xi Jinping hostile to the middle classes and private capital. Uh, I th he's not. He's not a hostile to them so long as they remain good party servants. To put it, good, that's a that. good snappy answer. Thank <laughs> you very much. I would say the private sector will be co-opted, and as for the middle class, the urban middle, second generation middle class, that I think is the biggest of red flags of all. Well, thank you very much. I think on that rather familiar, cheery note of everything will be fine as long as everybody supports the party. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, I will draw this panel discussion to a close, but we have we have drinks and nibbles outside in the foyer, and there are books, I think, being meant in the, on a store by somebody, and you're welcome to browse, and if you're interested, purchase copies. And the panelists will be there for some time, and so you will have a chance to talk to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.